Hi, Aaron Estrada here. Today we're going to look at creating a very simple, let's call it virtual set, using nothing more than a green screen and two tracking markers. When you can track two markers, you have enough information to get both translation and rotation based on the angle between the markers. So that means you can track pan, tilt, and roll in the camera and get a fairly convincing result. So the tool we need is called Tracker. I'm gonna get that by hitting Tab and starting to type Tracker. There's the Tracker and Enter. I'm not gonna go into all the details of the Tracker. So this is just the high points, but this will get you started. If you'd like to add new tracks, click the Add Tracks button here in the corner and you get tracks by clicking. Now the way a Tracker works is that the area inside this box here, the inner box, is the area or the pattern to look for. And the outer box is the area to look for that pattern. Now I've already shuttled through this clip so I know that it's moving quite a bit so I'm making the search area big enough so that it can find this pattern. And you'll notice I chose a corner. The reason for that is that corners never change. Whether they get bigger or smaller they always pretty much stay a corner. So they're usually the best thing to track. I'm going to add another here and adjust it similarly. And because there's no obstructions to this shot that block the marks on the screen, I'm just going to start on frame one and track all the way to the end. Since I'm interested in using both translation and rotation in my final result, I'm just going to check these check boxes off now. So this is for translation and this is for rotation. It means the results of the track will drive the translation and rotation in the solution that it provides for us. I'm going to select both trackers to make them active and I'm going to hit the track forward button here. Nuke will now do its best effort to track those patterns through the duration of the shot. There we go, and it seems like Nuke's done a pretty good job of tracking those points. They're slipping a little bit, you can see in the zoomed in thing here, but I think for our purposes on this shot that this is gonna be good enough. So to use the results of the tracking markers, there's a couple ways that you can use the tracker. It has the ability to be connected to something directly so I can now switch this into the mode where the tracker node itself becomes the transform. So if I go to this tab here, transform, and select the type of transform I would like, I can now have the tracker mode drive this type of transform. So let's say I wanted to do a match move. I could select that here. And now it will make the plate match move. Now this doesn't make any sense because it's still connected to the original plate. But if we connected it to this, you can see it's driving that along with a match move. Another way you can use it is by having it generate a completely new node that is expression linked to this node and it will have the appropriate math in the expression links to do what you select here. Now that's my preference. I, I prefer to work this way so what we want is a transform match move and rather than choosing the baked option which will put all the animation curves into the node that this generates I'm going to leave it expression linked by just selecting transform match moved so let's create that there we go we have that and we'll kind of tuck our tracker off to the side here to use as a little dock to keep our, all our tracking information in so let's see which background do I like let's use this one here the Brooklyn Bridge and as you can see, the Brooklyn Bridge is now being match moved around. Now it's going to match move around the center of wherever the tracks were done. This image is a little bit bigger than the image that we tracked, so the center is going to be somewhere around here. We've got to get this behind the girl in the plate, so we need to make a key. To do that, we're going to use the Primat node, just because it's, it's pretty good at making quick mats. Use auto compute to just very quickly have it guess the color of the screen. And I'm going to use the clean foreground noise 
mode here and the color picker to tell it what is foreground. I'm going to view here what is foreground and what is background. So I'm clicking, control clicking on the things that are definitely foreground to tell Primat to not key those things. And you'll notice I'm hitting A to toggle back to the alpha here. The screen is still not very solid. Let's get these little bits here, these holes. Control clicking. The screen is still not very solid, so I'm going to move to the clean background no mode of this color picker. And I'm going to click the background to tell it what's definitely background. I don't want to get too greedy here because that will start affecting the quality of my key. But I do want to get greedy enough that I can key out the things I don't want. So that's looking reasonable for a quick key. I'm not going to take it any further. You should probably take it further on yours, but you've got to keep the demo moving along. Now to quickly just drop the background behind it, I can connect it directly to the primat node, and that's the workflow I'm going to do here just to keep things simple. There we go. Make sure that I turn the color picker on primat off, and we have a quick key of the background of the girl over the background. Now there's still obviously a lot of junk in the shot, all this rigging that was in the set, and the not to mention that the background is not really well positioned. So let's fix them sort of in order. Let's get rid of, let's just clean up our mats first. To do that, we're going to use what's called a garbage mat, which is just a quick roto shape that cuts off all the stuff we don't want. So let's just view the girl directly so we can see what we might want to get rid of. And I'm going to drop down a roto node by hitting O. Now the roto node drops down ready to go, so I could just start clicking to add bezier knots. I'm not even going to bother making them nice and round. If I wanted to do that, I could drag while I'm doing it and make them round, but I don't even need them. And I'm going to try to create as few knots as possible because every knot I create in a GMAT is a knot that I'll have to manage, and I don't want to work that hard. I want to work the minimum amount possible. So that's great. I have a GMAT shape, but as you can see, the plate's moving around, so that's not great. But we have our tracker, and we can move our roto sh shape by using this motion from the tracker. Now, a simple way to do it would be to create a match move node for the roto shape and just push it around using the match mode, match move node. But a more slick way would be to expression link the shape to the shape in the roto. Now you notice that the roto shapes themselves, each one has its own transform tab. When I select the transform tab in the tracker node, you'll see I've got all this information. If I switch this to match move mode, this tab now becomes a calculator that generates match move motion that I can expression link to the transform tab in the roto node. So to do that, I'm going to hold down control while I drag this knob to the associated knob in the transform tab of the roto. So translate to translate, and now those two are expression link. I'm going to need this rotation too, so I'm going to hold down control and drag rotation. And then I want to copy the center point. So I'm not going to bother expression linking. I'm just going to drag it and drop it. And that will copy, drag it, and just cleared it out. Drag it and drop it in there. And that will copy the center point of this transform to my roto node. Now you'll see when I drag that the roto is being driven by its transforms or being driven by the transforms that are being generated in the tracker. So that's a slick way of getting animation into your roto node without even having to do any work or very much work. Now you'll notice that the shape is maybe not quite working perfectly because there's a moment here where it crashes into the girl and it also doesn't cut off this other stuff down here. So we need to give it a little bit more work, a little bit of keyframing here. So when you want to keyframe something that is slipping like this, uh, the, the best strategy is to wait until 
the moment when it is the worst it could possibly be and then add your keyframe there. So this is a form of doing breakdowns or in-betweens or like breakdowns where you're waiting until the shape has slipped off from what you wanted to do as much as possible and then you're correcting it <clears throat> on that frame. So that's what I've done here. And let's uh, move back a little and see if that's holding up for everything it needs to do. It seems to work in that moment here where it's cutting there. It's not crashing into her head or anything else there or her body. And it's cutting off all the junk. Uh, looks like it starts to slip a little bit the other way here where it's crashing into her head. So I'll do one keyframe there. Now Nuke automatically in betweens the knots on roto shapes when you drag them on a frame. So it's auto keying it for me. I don't have to do anything to create a keyframe there. It's getting a little close to her head there, but it's not touching and seems like, oh, there we go. Around here, it gets really bad. So it's crashing into the other side of her body and it gets its worst probably around here. So this is where we will make our next keyframe. The goal with G mats, garbage mats, is to keep them as simple and low work as possible. So the minimum amount of keyframes you can get away with and the simplest shape you can get away with. Because our beauty mat is coming from our, our key. We don't need to worry about generating a beautiful mat. We only need to worry about trimming off all of this rigging and grip equipment that was on the stage here. There we go. So that seems to be doing the job through the whole shot. So how are we going to use this shape now that we have created it? Well, let's change the logic of our comp a little bit here. Rather than using the primat node to do this composite, I am going to use a merge node, but first I'm going to prepare my background a little bit more. So I have my primat key and I'm going to hit the A key to show the alpha channel. There's the alpha and I have my roto shape. There's my roto's alpha. Well, I could do a couple of operations. Mats are just like any other image. They can be manipulated by all the same logic that any other image could be manipulated with. So I can use compositing logic to combine these two mats. Now what do these two mats have in common? Well, not much, but uh, on this one, I've got a dark area that pretty much everything in the dark area I know I want to get rid of in my beauty mat. So I could do something like multiply this mat against this mat to get rid of all these dark areas, or I could use a, mac a minimum and I could min the two together, or I could use a regular compositing operation like an in and I could put that mat inside this mat and then I would have a good result. So let's just let's start with using an in because that's a very common compositing merge. So I'm going to put A, which is my primat mat, inside of B. And then we'll view it down here. There you go. It's cut off everything. Now, depending on how you wanted the logic of your composite to flow, you might not want use, to use an in because if I was to dis disable this in, I'm hitting D here to disable it, you can see the result is maybe not what I expected. What's flowing through is my roto because the B pipe is always what flows through. The background is always what flows through a node when it's disabled. So I could use an alternate piece of logic here called mask, which is the is an in but with reversed logic and uh, now when I disable the node the background is what flows through so that's a little bit more intuitive when you disable a node so I would advocate
trying to keep your logic so that when you disable things, the logical flow through the comp is always a little bit stronger. Okay, so I've got the foreground all prepped. I've got all my garbage trimmed off. Now all I need to do is put this foreground over my background. So I'm going to use a regular merge over. I hit M to drop down a merge node. And you'll notice that by default, it's becoming the size of the background. And that's because of the way the, this is set here. The bounding box is becoming the union. I really only want the bounding box to become what is A. So now we'll trim it off at A. And I can drop down a crop node here to get rid of all of that extra junk. Easy shortcut to do this is you create a crop node at the resolution of the composite and then attach it and it will crop off everything and I can reformat to just trim off everything I don't want. So now I just need to position my background around a little bit. I can do that by putting a transform in between my match move and the thing I want to nudge around. So I, I hit T to drop down a transform and now I can position my background before I match move it. And I want to make sure that I have enough of a canvas there so that I don't shoot off the edges of my background as it's match moving around. So let's see, some final touches to make this really start to come together. You notice not only does the girl have motion blur, she's also a little bit fuzzy and out of focus. So in the best case scenario, the background can never really be sharper than the foreground unless the foreground is supposed to be out of focus in a rack focus type of scenario or something like that. So in this case, I would probably say blurring the background to make it at least as blurry as the foreground would be a good idea. So let's take that a little further. Let's defocus the background even. So I'm going to drop down a defocus node. I'm hitting tab and starting to type defocus. Now defocus is a little different from a regular Gaussian blur. It looks the, the node is designed to emulate the circles of confusion that a lens generates. So it will always look correct even if you add large radi radii of this. It will look more photographic. I'm not going to go quite that far. We'll just go a little bit. Enough to make it feel like they're in the same place. And maybe I want to grade the background a little bit as well so that it looks maybe like they're more in the same place. So I'm going to push down the gamma a little bit of the background. And use the gain to maybe put a little bit of this similar color that's on the girl into the background. And I'm not sure what, what's going to be the magic formula here because uh, it's hard to say. Sometimes what it needs, you're just doing it by eye. Just sort of what feels right. Background feels pretty bright though too, so let's bring it down just a bit. And then I'm gonna check the black levels and you'll see the blacks in the background have a distinctly different feeling than her blacks. So to fix that, I'm just gonna use the lift control here to change the color of black. I'm going to make the blacks the same color as the blacks in the girl. So let's say we'll pick color for these blacks from her blacks. And then that should redefine the black levels in the background to be a little bit more like the hue of her blacks. Now it's okay sometimes if the background feels a little bit more flashed than the foreground. And the reason for that is that the atmosphere is there. There's a little bit of fog or something in the environment. You'll always have a slightly more hazy effect as things get further in the distance. This is a matter of taste, how far to go. That would probably be too much. You know, this would be too crunchy in the background, but somewhere, somewhere in this realm of where they feel roughly the same. That's that little touch. We'll turn on the motion blur for the match move to make sure that the background has 
mat matching motion blur to the motion in the foreground. And then maybe one final touch that we could do here to really bring this together is if we look at our the bottom of our comp, it looks as if, okay, I'm going to blank out the alpha channel here by using a shuffle node. So I'm going to kill the alpha channel of the background so that only the girl's alpha channel comes through. And then I can use this really quick and dirty edge blur node that ships with Nuke. And that will help blend. It will essentially blur the background and the foreground together. So tab edge blur. You've got to be very light handed with this. This is way too strong by default. But if you just kind of kiss in just a smidge of that, it has a great it's a great way of sort of blending the foreground and the background together now this key still needed a lot of work before you even brought it to this level of edge blur but i did want to expose you to this node see obviously we've got to screen suppress that green in her hair and a lot of other problems that would have needed work first but now you can see pretty decent looking comp not a lot of time and those are all the high points that you should hit in order to create a fairly convincing comp every time. By the time you had a better matte extraction on this foreground and maybe a little bit more color balancing between the two because they still don't feel quite right. One last detail that you should definitely take into consideration is the difference between the grain in the foreground and the background. If you look closely between these two plates, the background was just a still image and the foreground plate of the girl is from some kind of noisy video source. And if you look at her skin tone, it's, it's really a little bit more apparent that there's a roiling sort of video noise in her face. Now, this kind of noise is particularly difficult to replicate because it's so fine and uh, doesn't really look like film grain or anything. But uh, you should try to at least create something that emulates this in the background. Because right now, if you look at this, you'll see the background just looks very static and uh, almost electronic compared to her organic noisiness. Nuke X ships with a pretty good node called F Grain that can uh, emulate grain based on a sample. So I'm taking this grain pipe and connecting it to my background here before any of my composite and connecting the F Grain after all of my motion blur and, and other filters have been applied. So First thing you got to do to use every grain is you need to pick a region that you want to sample as grain. So let's uh, let's use this this part of one, uh, the rigging up here of this lamp since it's a nice flat gray area. Let's see if we can get away with this much. Yep, that looks like that's working. So now every grain will sample that gray area and it will use that to create a profile that it generates. A grain from. So let's look at our let's look at our comp now. You see the background is getting a similar sort of roiling grain to the foreground. Now I don't know if it's perfect. The next step would be to go through and tune it channel by channel. So if we look at the red here and we open up the every grain controls. You can control them by channel. So we're looking at the red channel. I'm going to look at regions that are a similar value and we'll adjust. We'll use that as our visual sort of cue to get the amounts to be the same. So that looks about, about the same. I'm going to the green channel, channel now and you'll see there's a certain amount of noise there. I'm going to crank up the green amount until it matches. And now into the blue channel. The blue has quite a bit, so we're going to crank it up quite a bit in the blue channel. And I think maybe the blue size that every grain chose is a little bit bigger than what was in the plate. So let's try to adjust it here. Now, if we look at all the channels together and we Hmm, might have gone a little too far. Let's turn it down just a little bit overall. We'll look at it one to one and we'll make a quick flip book or a RAM player. 
there we go and we can see this isn't perfect but it's taken a lot of that electric and tooth smooth curse or the sort of lifelessness out of the background by adding a little bit of grain that matches the foreground grain or at least uh, some grain it doesn't really match in this case but if, with the continued tuning the grain could be made to match much closer so I'm interested to see what you come up with in yours uh, it'd be great if you could take it as far as putting some grain on there also and uh, just trying to make the quality of the two images match a little bit better.